Thank you, John. We gather in this sacred space, made more sacred in this moment by the presence and attention of each and every one of us. In a spirit of welcome, I invite those gathered in the sanctuary to greet those attending from home by waving and saying hello from right where you are. And for those of us in the sanctuary, let's take a moment to greet one another. A lively group this morning, despite the heat. Uh, so. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Parapellic, today's worship associate, and it's so nice to be with you. The Winchester Unitarian Society is a welcome, welcoming, caring community devoted to spiritual growth, social transformation, and environmental responsibility. Guided by Unitarian Universalist principles and the diverse traditions of many faiths, we live our values through worship, reflection, connection, and service. Here we welcome all, people of all racial and ethnic backgrounds, people of all sexual orientations and genders, people of all incomes and abilities, people of all beliefs, and people with few religious connections. We know you are here for different reasons, to find community, to seek your spiritual and personal truth, to question, to nurture your heart and your soul, to be nurtured, to explore new ideas, to find comfort, and perhaps to find the answers to some of your bigger questions. We hope this is a place where joys are amplified and where your sorrows are lessened. Today is a special summer service led by members of our racial justice team planning group, with the second reflection being delivered by my friend and fellow worship associate, Dr. Harris Gibson. We're so glad he agreed to do this along with Gloria Legvold, Patty Shepard, Robbie Brown, and Claire McNeil. The planning team will be hosting a discussion after the coffee hour, and we expect that will begin at around 11.30 this morning. Today is also the first Sunday of the month, which means we'll be singing happy birthday during coffee hour to anyone born in August. Now let us open our hearts and minds to this morning's worship with these words. Our opening words this morning are from Toni Morrison, one of our most respected and celebrated authors, who in her 2019 book, The Source of Self-Regard, writes of the fault lines of culture and freedom. Now, no one can fault the conqueror for writing the history the way he sees it, and certainly not for digesting human events and discovering their patterns according to his point of view. But we can fault him for not owning up to what his point of view is. I now invite Robbie Brown and Patty Shepard to light our chalice. The chalice lighting words this morning are from W.E.B. Dubois, The Souls of Black Folk. Education, among all kinds of men, always has had and always will have an element of danger and revolution, of dissatisfaction and discontent. Nevertheless, men strive to know. Please rise and body your spirit to join in singing the opening hymn 
This Little Light of Mine, which is number 118 in the Gray Hymnal. Okay, can you hear me all right? I'm Patty, and I'm inviting all the young folks and the young at heart to come up here with me on the steps for a very short reflection. So we did get a, quite a few kids here, didn't we? Great, wonderful, and there are lots of folks in the back too, I'm sure. So, a little later today, Harris Gibson is going to talk about a very amazing man named Robert Smalls, who lived in South Carolina over 150 years ago. A picture of him is on the screen, it looks like, right? Okay, good. Robert Smalls did a lot of very brave and smart things in his life. But I'm just going to tell you about one of the many things that he did that I think you might find interesting. He was a black man and was born into slavery in South Carolina. Does anyone know down here what that means to be born into slavery? Yeah, somebody want to give it a shot? You know, you want to say anything? That sounds, everybody's shaking their heads, so that sounds like that was a good answer. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear it, but. Um, <laughs> so, um, let's see. This thing that I want to tell you about took place at the end of his life, after the Civil War was over. Does anyone know what the Civil War was about? Well, you want to give it a try this time? It was a war to end slavery versus the North and the South. The North believed that slavery was evil and bad. Wow, that was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, let's see. I, got, I lost my place, and I'm not, I can't remember things. <laughs> okay, now I found it again. After the Civil War, Robert Smalls ran for public office and served many terms as a representative to the state legislature and the United States Congress. One of the things that representatives do is to carefully write down and vote for new laws or rules that everyone has to abide by. Robert Smalls cared a great deal about every child having a good education. 
So he wrote the state legislation for South Carolina to have the first free and compulsory public school system in the United States. And luckily, enough of the other representatives voted for it that it passed and became a law. That meant that for a time, it didn't cost the children to go to school and no one could be excluded. Even today, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure every child gets a good education. But Robert Small really helped to make it a new rule in South Carolina over 150 years ago. And I just wanted to ask what you think about that. It's sort of a rhetorical question, which means I want you to just, yeah, and that's a great answer. OK, <laughs> thank you very much. You guys have a good rest of the morning. We are now entering the, the centering part of the service. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we'll begin by reflecting on our joys and sorrows, and by doing so, we also acknowledge the mutual support of being a member of this community. Then we'll be, we'll be together during a moment of shared silence. We will emerge from that by singing hymn number 86, Blessed Spirit of My Life. And as we begin, I want to remind everybody gathered that this service is being recorded and will be made public on our website immediately following. I now invite anyone to come in the sanctuary to come forward to share a special joy or sorrow and to light a candle. Okay. 
Hello, I'm Joe Eiler. I think uh, those of you that were here last week know my wife stood up here and announced that we were going to Indiana. Uh, my mother turned 100, and we had 70 people show up. All of our family, all of my children, all my brother's children, it was a wonderful, wonderful time, and, and she just was a spark of enjoyment. I'm very grateful. For those of you that have been around for the last two months, I don't have to say a word. See that? <laughs> huh? Huh? See that? Big joy. Good morning, I'm Patty Cameron. I served on the interim search committee and we are overjoyed that Reverend Seth Carrier Ladd started this Thursday. We had a lovely uh, greeting breakfast with, us, with him and we hope and look forward to the time when we can introduce him to you all. We are thrilled that he is here. As a former teacher, we've, we were taught to wait seven seconds when, you, when they are asking a question, but that was more than seven seconds. So I'm going to share a, a joy and a sorrow. The joy is I just spent the week, we have an annual reunion week with friends on the Cape in P-Town. It's the best week of the year, uh, and I just got back from that, so I'm feeling really happy and joyful, having spent time with people that I don't get to see very often. But I also have a sorrow, which is that, as many of you know, I'll be leaving in three weeks. We're moving back to New York, and this is my final uh, time being your worship associate. And it just hit me when I rang the bell for the last time that this would be the last time I'll get to look at you from this, uh, this angle. I do hope to come back and visit, and you've all been so wonderful. And being in Winchester, being part of this community was the best part of being in Winchester for the past nine years. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't realize you stood up. Thank you. <laughs> I'll ask Martin to light one more candle. We thank those who have spoken, those who have been named, and those we hold in silence in our hearts. The final candle was lit for those, for all the joys and sorrows that remain unspoken, and for those at home.
My name is Claire McNeil, and I'm going to be doing a reading from the book Lies My Teacher Told Me, written by sociologist James Lowen, who critiqued textbooks written for American history classes. Textbooks encourage students to believe that history is just facts to be learned. But because textbooks employ such a godlike tone, it never occurs to most students to question them. Students are not prepared to analyze controversial issues in our own society. The hope is to get students thinking about causality. In teaching about slavery, many textbooks present slavery as a tragedy rather than a wrong perpetrated by some people on other people. Although history books no longer sugarcoat how slavery affected African Americans, they minimize causation. Many depictions of Washington and Jefferson are at variance with their lives as slaveholding planters. For example, in 2003, when an Illinois teacher told her sixth grade class that most presidents before Lincoln were slave owners, they were outraged, not with the presidents, but with her for lying to them. That's not true, they protested, or it would be in the book. They pointed out that their textbook devoted many pages to Washington, Jefferson, Madison and Jackson and other early presidents, but said not a word about their owning slaves. After her students convinced themselves that she was right, they were outraged with their textbook and wrote a letter to the publisher receiving only a bland reply. Unlike slavery, racism is not over. In order to function in civic life today, students must learn what factors cause racism, a complicated historical issue. Telling the truth about the past can help us make it right from here on. Lowen said, I believe that most Americans, once they understand why things are as they are, will want to work to foster justice where there had been unfairness and truth where lies had prevailed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Third article, Constitution, three-fifths human. What are we doing? We are here to say that life is free. What are we saying? My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. 1831, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Francis Samuel Smith. What are we doing? What are we saying? We say that until the lion tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. In 1839, a man was born that Patty mentioned. His name was Robert Smalls. He was born in a cabin behind a house in the city of Beaufort, South Carolina. He was the son of a woman named Lydia who worked in the big house. She had previously had worked in the fields just like all the other black people had to do. After he was born, since she was working in the house, he lived in the house most of the time and in that cabin. So he didn't experience all of the things that the other black kids did experience in that time. They were enslaved. They were property. She was concerned about Robert because if he didn't learn more about what black people had to suffer, he might not survive very long. At, at about the age of 12, Lydia pre presented a, a, a possible ad ad atmosphere for Robert and said if he was working in the city of Charleston, he could make money 
there and give the money to you, keeping you only one dollar one week per week, uh, what, you, what you might make during that. Act. So the slave owner, McKee was his name, decided to let that happen. So at the age of 12, he was working in hotels and around the city of Charleston, making a fair amount of money, but only able to keep one dollar of it each week. When he got to be about 13 or 14, he didn't want to work just in the hotel. He started to walk around the city of Charleston, and he got a job by the time he was 16 on the wharf or the piers in Charleston, South Carolina. This was about the time the Civil War was getting ready to start. Just before the Civil War started, he got a job on a ship. He had learned to repair sails. He had learned a lot of the techniques that were used to keep the ships afo afloat. And because of this, he was allowed to work on a ship, but he couldn't have a title. He was an intelligent person, but he was illiterate. He did learn how to pilot ships, and he was given the responsibility of piloting a ship called a planter. Initially, that ship was used just to transfer goods like cotton, rice, etc. But when the Civil War started in 1861, they converted that to a ship to carry troops and ammunition and products of war. And because of this, he had to do more and more work on that ship. He be really became a pilot of that ship, but he couldn't have that title because black men couldn't have such a uh, title as that. The Civil War had gone on about a year. Just before he started to work on that ship, he married a woman that worked in a hotel. She was about five years older than he was, but he was a good talker, hard worker, so he was able to fulfill the it, obligations of being a husband. He decided he wanted to purchase her freedom and purchase his freedom, but they said that the cost would be about $800. Doesn't sound like a lot of money, but at that time, $800 was worth about $27,000. He felt he wouldn't be able to do that. So while he was working upon that ship, he tried to figure out a way he could make himself free and make his family free. So he came up with an idea. Commandeer or steal the ship. <laughs> Sounds like something impossible for the illiterate black man. There were about nine crew members on that ship. He didn't trust one of them, so he didn't share this information to him about the possibility of stealing the ship. At the right time, on May the 2nd, 1862, he decided to implement this theory that he had. He had mentioned it to his wife a couple of times, but she didn't take him seriously. He told her to prepare a sheet, a white bed sheet. For what, she asked, just prepare the sheet. He then told the members of the crew that, look, here's what we can do. We can steal this ship. We've frequently been available to have the possibility of staying aboard the ship for a few hours when all of the crew members have gone away, all of the white ones, that is. On May the 2nd, he said, have your wife and children or your friends that you feel close to come to the ship after the crew goes into the hotels and, and they plan to stay there all night. When that occurred, he had them sit on the deck of the ship and explain to them the way he had planned to do this. They'd have to get off the ship early and go as if they're going home, but not to go home. Because when it gets real dark and real quiet, we can steal this ship. He knew all of the signals associated with running the ship. He knew how to steer the ship. He had the other crew members who had worked upon the ship to know how to use it. And they were within seven miles of the blockade that was set up by the Union Army and Union Navy. They could see it, but they would dare go near it. Now, it was difficult to get out of the harbor. Had to do so by giving signals, blowing the whistles at the right at the proper time. But he learned all of this, and he knew how to do it. When he talked to the family, they were all frightened of the possibility of being killed in the process. He made them understand that if we are caught, we will destroy the ship along with ourselves. 
but we will never be slaves again. Finally, they all agreed. At about midnight, the families left the ship as though they were going home, but they didn't go home. The crew stayed aboard ship, and when it was dark enough and quiet enough, around 2, 2 a.m., he left the harbor with the ship and went towards the wharf where the families were waiting. They boarded the ship, and he started to steer the ship out of the harbor, having to go about five new stops, uh, five areas where the ship might be inspected. Each of those places he had to give a signal, whistles and motions and actions. He had placed clothing on himself to make him look like the captain of the ship. When they reached Fort Sumner, that was the difficult part because it was well fortified, many, many troops were there. When he got there, he went closer to Fort Sumner than usual so they could see him, but not really seeing because it was now 4 a.m. He couldn't see very well. But he gave the proper signals and eventually they let him pass. As soon as he exited that area, he went towards the Union Army blockade. They attempted to fire, but it was, they were too far away. He reached a ship called the Onward, SS Onward. As he approached that ship, he raised the white flag and instead of firing upon the ship that they were planning to do, they saw the flag and they did not fire. The ship then approached the Onward, and as it approached the stern of the Onward, Robert Small says, gentlemen, sir, I have for you some old United States guns and ammunition, sir. The captain of that ship, called the Onward, descended upon the deck of the planter and witnessed free acting black men, but no white men, and they wondered how could they do this. They had a treasure trove because at that point, he presented them the code books that placed all of the stations around that area in terms of troops, ammunition stores, torpedoes and mines that may damage Union ships if they claimed came too close. In addition to that, Robert Smalls had planted some of these torpedoes and mines to prevent the whites from the south, from the north, getting into the harbor. He also informed them at that time that you might think that there were a lot of troops here, but they departed this area to go to Tennessee and to Virginia, and there were very few troops left in this area except at Fort Sumner. This news traveled really fast because the captain of that ship related it to Fort DuPont. And by doing so, the information was sent to Washington, was sent to Philadelphia, and everyone now in the country was able to see this. They congratulated this man and in, in his ability to do this and wondered how he was able to do it. The treasure trove included Robert Smalls himself, because he knew a lot about everything associated with military activities and actions in Charleston, South Carolina. And this was the seat, as you know, Fort Sumner is where the Civil War started. By delivering him that ship, he was given a reward along with other of the black crew on that ship. His share was $1,500. Doesn't sound like much. Today it would be $45,000. The first thing he did was to hire himself a tutor to learn to read and write. The second thing he did was to help the Union Army and Navy in their battles against the Confederacy. Here's what happened next. They wanted him to go to Washington, perhaps, but better so, to New York City, so he could help raise funds for the enslaved people who are now free and help them to have money to do things with. There were other thoughts by other people, including Generals Fre Fremont and General Sherman, to perhaps help him to convince Lincoln, along with the Secretary of War, Stanton, to permit them to recruit 
blacks for the military. This had not been done before. They recruited 5,000 African Americans to, to fight with the Union Army. Over the next few weeks and years, he supplied the Union Army with lots of information. He became the captain of the planter at one time because the persons who they have, had made the captain of the ship decided in a battle to give up the ship. He refused to do that. He kept the ship, got it to safe harbor, and with that, he was made a captain, or at least that's the title he was given. Later on, you found out that they didn't give captain designations to black people who had not gone to any of the academies. Despite that, he fought in 17 different battles against the Confederacy. He was available to meet Sherman at the sea when Sherman made a march from Atlanta to the sea. He was in the sea awaiting him and had equipment there for him. In addition to that, he had to take the ship to Philadelphia to be repaired. And when he did so, the Republican convention was going on, so he decided to go to that convention, and they knew who he was and what he was able to do, and he was asked to speak to them, but while he was on his way there, he was in public transportation, and in public transportation, he was not allowed to sit in the car if a white person had to stand. He was asked to leave. The Republican, Republican convention knew about this and found out about this, and they changed the laws in terms of intercity transportation in Pennsylvania in 1867 because of what happened to their hero, Smalls. In addition to that, he went back to the South. He was captain of several ships and piloted in several ships, became a light, lighthouse director in, in several areas. And because of this, he was asked to come to Sumner, Fort Sumner, in 1865, when it was reoccupied by the Union Army. He stayed in the s duties of an active serviceman for many, many years. He thought he had a commission as captain. When it was time to retire, he found out that was not so. Despite that, he continued to work and work and work. At the end of the war, he went back to South Carolina. And in South Carolina, some of the things you know about, Patty mentioned, the establishing the possibility of schools for everybody in every state in the, in the Union. But it was the first time it had ever been done for anybody. Only rich people, black or white, were able to go to school. That included George Washington. He wasn't able to go to school either. His older brother did, but he was sent back to England to go to school. When George came along, there was no money for George to go to school, so he, he had to be given a book. He taught to read by his mother, and that was the basis of his education. But that was true for poor people in the entire country. It was true in the entire country, particularly for black people. Well, you say, well, okay, the story ends there. It does not. He became a member of the Republican Party, which didn't exist in the South before that. He served in the state as a representative, and he served in the federal system. He was in the United States Congress, number 44, number 45, number 47, 48, and 49. He was working diligently. Remember that prize money we talked about? He used some of that money to build a school in both Warford, both South Carolina. He hired himself a teacher there for nine months. He worked during the day and at night he had this teacher to teach him for nine consecutive months so that he would be prepared. He learned to be a lecturer he did writings, etc. So he really was not dependent upon anybody else except himself to do things. You would say, well, that's where the story ends. It didn't. Next month, 
his great, great grandson is running for that same seat in South Carolina as a representative. It is said that, and it's, it's so it's supposedly a proverb, in Africa, it says, until the lion tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. Thank you. Our weekly offering is an opportunity of dedication, an invitation to live our values through acts of generosity. In this way, the offering is a spiritual practice, a collective affirmation of our shared values and commitment to the mission of this liberal religious congregation. Those attending via live stream will soon see information about how to donate, and those in the sanctuary are also welcome to donate electronically. You will find more information in the order of service. If you are visiting for the first time, we invite you to be our guest. The most valuable thing you can offer is your completed visitor information card so we can stay connected beyond this Sunday. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received. Those who wish to do so are invited to join me in reciting our shared uh, affirmation. We gather not for ourselves alone, but to use our common power to build the beloved community within and beyond these walls. 
we create and reaffirm this covenant this day to make justice flourish, to practice compassion amidst difference, and to embody transformative love. Now please rise in body or in spirit to join in singing hymn We Are, number 1051 in the Teal Hymnal. Our closing words are a call to action from John Lewis, who spent his entire life leading seminal moments in the civil rights movement, and he became the conscience of Congress. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Do not become bitter or hostile. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. We will find a way to make a way out of no way. May it be so.
please join me in reciting the words for extinguishing our chalice. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. This service has ended, but our life of service continues. Please be reminded that today is the first Sunday of the month, so we'll be singing happy birthday at some point during coffee hour. We hope there's some August birthdays among us today. Yay, good. <laughs> and then uh, at around 11.30, there'll be a discussion in the parlor with the members of the racial justice planning team. We hope you can join us there. Thank you.